invite you to stand as we worship together. Let's get our hands together this morning. you to greet your neighbor with the love of Christ this morning. Give a handshake or a hug. Remain standing as you're able. Let us join together in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as our guide. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. What a gift it is. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. If you are so thankful for your mom today, would you give God a hand clap of praise? All right. I love it. I love watching the, the, specifically the kiddos clap for their moms. All right. Hey, kiddos. You got to be kind to your mom today. Listen, uh, cook them breakfast or dinner. You already had, well, cook them brunch after worship. Like, find a way to bless them today. It is a gift. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so, hey, guys, um, I just want to remind you, if you are a guest with us, welcome. Welcome to Covenant. We're so honored to have the opportunity to worship with you. Uh, there are a couple of cards in the seat back in front of you. The first is a guest card. I'm new. Hey, if, if you would just fill that out, we would love to connect with you. We believe that, that it's not accident that you're here, that, that, that you uh, took this opportunity to step forward, to enter into this community of faith this morning. Uh, we would love to uh, reciprocate that, to reach out, to connect with you, and let you know how honored we are to worship with you. Uh, and also, there's a prayer card there. We know in, of the power of prayer. And we believe that there's an opportunity we have to join together, to intercede for one another. And so I just would uh, relish the opportunity for you to fill out that prayer card uh, and let us know what the prayer on your heart is today. And you could leave either of those in the chest in the back of the sanctuary on your way out of worship. At this time, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward for this morning's offering as I share just a couple of invitations for you. The first invitation... It's just uh, is this also kind of woven into a celebration. Next Sunday is Confirmation Sunday for us here at Covenant. We have students that were on Confirmation Retreat this last weekend. We were up here at the church uh, having so much fun in fellowship with one another and studying the Word of God, studying what it means to, to answer these questions of the profession of faith. And, and so I invite you to be praying for our confirmands over the course of this week, to be intentional about lifting them up in prayers. They're going to be approaching uh, this space a week from now and, and confirming their faith and sharing a testimony of, of what God is doing in their lives as they stand before you. So I hope that you will be praying for them. Uh, the, the second invitation I have is uh, for you to join with our, our mission team and our partnership uh, with Metzler Elementary uh, and the way in which we are uh, partnering to bless that school. Particularly, this is Teacher Appreciation Month. And, and there's a, a, an opportunity that we have to bless all of the teachers and administrators there at Metzler. And uh, there are 78 different uh, teachers and administrators. And we have, our mission team has prepared a table. When you walk out of the sanctuary, it's the one with the black cloth on it just uh, out to the right. There are 78 note cards addressed to those specific uh, teachers and administrators. And I hope that you will take time today to grab one of those cards and write just a note of encouragement. And if you're like, ah, brain freeze, I don't know what to say. They even gave sample notes that you could, uh, you could just say, this is the one that speaks my heart on this card for this teacher. Uh, this isn't something that you take home as homework. Uh, this is something that we do today. So, so grab a card. If you need to look at the sample, look at the sample. Find a little spot in the commons and then put it back in the basket. And our mission team will be able to offer that blessing of support and kindness to those teachers that are doing so much for our community, for our students. And, and it's just a way for us to show them love. So uh, remember, there's 78. So look around. That means that, that at least half of you uh, need to be engaged, like thinking about, I'm going to do this today. Or maybe you need to be the one that goes and gets four or five cards because the Lord sets that on your heart. God bless you. But we hope that, uh, that this would be an opportunity for us to, to be that rich partner uh, with Metzler in this community. Let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer and pray over our mothers and spiritual mothers. Just a word of thanksgiving and blessing. Let's pray. Father, Father, we come before you so thankful this morning. Thankful for, uh, for, our, for our wives, thank, thankful for our mothers, uh, thankful for our spiritual mothers, those that, that, that poured into us, into our lives, and blessed us, formed us, in fact. 
Lord, we ask that you would, you would uh, make this day particularly special, uh, anointed blessing for them. And, and Lord, today we, we also lift up those that, that long to be mothers. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would, that, that you would give them a sense of comfort and of peace, and that your holy presence would be with them as you meet and answer their prayers. And, and for all of those this day that experience some sense of, of longing uh, for a mother who, is, who has been lost, has gone on into glory, Father, we ask that you, would, that you would just touch them with your peace today, your comfort, that they would, that they would know what it is to be intimately uh, blessed, connected with you, uh, and, and let them know that, that you have welcomed their mothers into your heavenly kingdom and give them that, that surety today. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move uh, amongst us as we worship you. Lord, that this space and time would be fully, wholly devoted to you, that you would be glorified in our worship, that all that is done in this space and time would bring you praise. For it's in Jesus' name that we, your people, pray. Amen. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Still as you call me, deeper. 
Let's hear this word. It's a letter for the Ephesians, a prayer for the Ephesians. And I want this to be a prayer for us as well today. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Oh, 
that scripture in mind as we praise him. Lord, I pray that we would know how wide, how high, how deep is the love of Christ poured over us. Church, let that be an outpouring in our worship. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those Don't you get shy on me Let's have your song Cause you got a lot you are worthy of all our praise and so much more. Lord, I pray that that scripture would come to life for us, that we would be rooted and established in your love, or that we would know the depths of the love that you have for us. Thank you, God, for your sacrifice, for your love that's always available to us. We worship you, God. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name. Join me now in the prayer that our Father, our, our Lord, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Kids, you are dismissed to Cuff Kids. We'll see you later. Have fun with Miss Jen and Miss Amber Nicole. And y'all can have a seat. And while they are le uh, leaving the room, if you would join me in 1 Samuel chapter 1. This is where our passage is going to be at today. 1 Samuel chapter 1.
The word of the Lord declares, once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanai made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for, for meeting with us again in the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, and especially in the gift of your word, that you speak to us, that you offer yourself to us in this in this account of your movement, uh, the, the movement that you had amongst your people over the course of history, Lord, what a treasure your holy scriptures are. And so now as we approach this time, we, we do so uh, humbly offering it to you, asking, Lord, that you would open our eyes that we would see, open our ears that we would hear, open our minds that we would come to know and understand your word Open our hearts that we would feel its power. Then in response, I pray that you would open our hands, that we would be a people offering grace to your world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage of Scripture is particularly uh, precious to me uh, because I... I, I I'm deeply connected to it through one of my dearest friends. Uh, one of my friends and his wife, uh, early in their marriage, had, uh, had dreams and hopes, visions to be able to have a family. And after years and years of trying to have children, they were, it seemed, barren. They were unable to conceive children, and, and, and they were with Lauren and I whenever we went on a trip to Israel years ago. And, and it, was, it was a beautiful thing for so many young pastors and their spouses to be able to travel to Israel together. We study with Jerusalem University, and it was an extraordinary opportunity to really stand and walk and talk where Jesus stood and walked and talked. I mean, it, it was a gift to my life. But it was an even greater gift because I was able to do it with friends and colleagues. So my, my buddy and his wife were there with, with, with Lauren and myself. And, and I remember the day whenever we uh, had uh, time at the Temple Mount. Uh, they, they took us over to the Temple Mount and we were there on the southern steps. And we walked through the gates of the city. And then we approached this plaza. This plaza that is known as the Western Wall or, or in other, uh, other monikers known as the Wailing Wall. 
And there's a space just uh, to the north of that western wall, a cove where Jews come and pray and petition the Lord daily. And they, they, they kind of shake before the Lord and offer their hearts to the Lord. And then there's uh, an expansive 17-tier uh, of stacked large stones uh, on this western face of the wall. And, and the people of God, Christians and Jews, come to this western wall, and they, many of them write their prayers and, and leave their prayers, and they spend time at the Temple Mount praying. And, and this is a specific, uh, a specific location that has power and potency for the Jewish people particularly because uh, while the Jewish people are no longer allowed on the Temple Mount, this western wall is the closest location that you can be to where the Holy of Holies would have sat in the Jewish temple. And, and so you're as close to that intimate connection with God as the Jewish people are allowed. And so Christians also gather at that wall to pray. And my friend and his wife wrote their prayer that had been the prayer of their heart and of their lips in their home and in their community for year after year after year. They wrote it and they went to that wall and they wept before the Lord, cried out to God that God would answer their prayers and give them a child. And there as they leaned against the wall, almost crumbling before the Lord, feeling the weight of, of uh, of this impassioned plea, this desire for the Lord to answer, there was an older woman that approached and laid her hands on my friend's wife and said, the Lord hears your prayer. And in that kind of intimate moment, they were restored kind of uh, in, in faith and they were lifted up and uh, you can't, Make this up how beautiful the Lord is in his faithfulness. Within a few months, they conceived and they had twins. And as they conceived, and my friend shared this celebration with me, uh, he told me that they felt in that moment at the Wailing Wall that they were appealing to God as Hannah did before the Lord at his temple in Shiloh. So this passage is just rich for me. It's rich with potency of connection and, and understanding. But for us to kind of dig into to where we arrived at verse 9, I do want to, uh, there's only eight verses before. I do want to kind of set the stage of where we were when we approached these verses and then make sure that we're on the same page as what this means for us, not just for those that are crying out to the Lord for a child, but what this means for all of us and invite the Lord to, to, to call us to that. So there is a man named Elkanah. Elkanah is an Ephraimite. He, he is a faithful man, devoted to the Lord. Why do we know this? We know this because it says that year after year, every year, he made pilgrimage to Shiloh. Shiloh was where the, the, the house of the Lord was prior to it being in Jerusalem. It was there for hundreds of years. Uh, and, the, and the ark of the Lord was there. And so this was a holy place. And Elkanah and his family would make pilgrimage to worship there every year. Beautiful devotion. So this is a man of God. This, this man of God has two wives. Now, now, I want you to know that this is not an endorsement of polygamy. Uh, I know sometimes in Scripture we hear some of this and, and, and we kind of run down this rabbit trail in our, in our minds of what does this mean? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for the definition of marriage? How can I like, like think through this? I want you to know that this is descriptive, not prescriptive. It's descriptive of what Elkanah had in his family relationships. It's not prescriptive of what God desires for us in our relationships, Okay. That we could go into that more broadly in another sermon, but I think that's a helpful note that sometimes the Bible describes things that isn't in alignment with God's will. It's not a prescription, it's a description. So Elkanah had two wives. He had uh, Penina and had Hannah. These are his two wives. And one of his wives, Penina, had many children. And then Hannah had no children. 
And, and this created disconnect, dissonance, a rivalry of sorts between these two women. And so much so that Penina would, would, would provoke, the scriptures say, provoke Hannah in, in, in such a way that it would uh, uh, make Hannah downcast and sorrowful. She would weep. She wouldn't eat. She would, uh, she would feel great sorrow. And, and in compassion for uh, Hannah... Elkanah would give a portion of food to all of his children by Penina and to Penina, but in order to try to encourage Hannah and a sign of love and compassion for Hannah, even in the midst of her grief, he would give her a double portion to try to show his love and affection for her. That his love wasn't dependent on whether or not she had kids, that his affection wasn't dependent upon whether or not she had kids, but he cared genuinely for her. And so Hannah, it says, experienced this uh, provoking experience, this despair, year after year, it says. So we don't know how many years, we just know that this went on for many years, multiple years. Uh, Hannah tried to conceive, tried to have children, was not able to have children, was crying out to the Lord, was, was, uh, was picked on, provoked by, uh, by Penina, and in that space continued to weep, not eat, and year after year this continued. So then we arrive at this moment in verse 9 where now we, we, we come to uh, another pilgrimage, uh, uh, not unlike previous pilgrimage. Uh, they had done this year after year, and still, as this shift takes place, now they arrive again at Shiloh, again at the house of the Lord, and there in that space, again, Penina provokes Hannah. Hannah is deeply downtrodden, and she cries out to the Lord. It says dinner was concluded, and after dinner, dinner, Hannah stood up, and then she went close enough to be near Eli. Now, Eli is the priest of the temple at Shiloh at the time, and, and so it's, it's assumed, or easy to assume, that Hannah approached closer to the ark of the Lord uh, to draw an intimacy with God, and she cried out to God. And this kind of desperate prayer was rising up out of her soul. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was audibly spoken. It was something that she was just pouring herself out to God. She was weeping It it, it says, in great grief and longing. It even describes this prayer as her lips weren't moving, but her heart was being expressed to God. And, and, and so, or, or actually, let me rephrase that. Her lips were moving, but her voice wasn't speaking. Sorry about that. Her lips weren't moving, but her voice wasn't speaking. And so Eli observed this, observed this woman that's crying out, that, 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 is, that is moving her lips, but nothing is coming out of her mouth. And he says, you're drunk. You've been drinking. This is obvious. And, you know, dinner had just passed. Maybe that was something that he saw uh, all too often. Uh, and, and he had no problem rebuking her. And so he rebuked her, cut out the drink. And so uh, Hannah says, no, my Lord, no, that's not the case. I have not had wine or beer. I'm not drunk. Instead, I am desperately crying out to God. I'm praying to the Lord. I have not been able to bear a child. And in my despair, I am inviting the Lord's holy presence. I'm praying that God would move in me. And as she articulates that reality, that heartfelt appeal, Eli sees fit to offer blessing over her. He says to her, may it be with you as you are praying. May this blessing come upon you. May it be fulfilled. I, I, I love how how intricate this moment is that, that as soon as Eli offers this blessing, offers this appeal, intercedes on her behalf, comes alongside her in this prayer, uh, it, it's almost as though something in Hannah immediately changes. It says she gets up from there. She's no longer weeping. She goes and she eats. And it says that her face, her face is no longer downcast. 
It, it, it's as though her face showed the grief, the pain, that, that, that it was all over her. I want you to think about when you've seen someone in great despair, you could see it on their face. They don't even have to tell you. They don't have to have tears go down their face. They don't have to, uh, to have a wobble in their voice. They don't have to, to cry out verbally. You could see it in their face. And that same thing happened in Hannah. And it said her face that was once downcast was now restored. Her face transformed in the moment that this blessing came upon her. And her prayer to the Lord joined with Eli's prayer to the Lord. And together the Lord heard and responded. It says there for us that, that, the, uh, that the holy word uh, moves powerfully for Hannah. And as she returns home, she and Elkanah come together and she is able then to conceive a son. Now, now I want you to kind of also hear that the devotion that Hannah had, this is wild, okay? Uh, I don't know how this, this actually like works, uh, Hannah's faith. It says that when Hannah was praying for a child, Hannah prayed so fer- fervently for the child that she even committed this child to the Lord. She said, if you bless me with this child, Lord, I'm going to give my child to you for all of their days, for all of his days. He's going to be solely devoted to you. Now, now, if I was a mom, pray, which I, that's odd. If I was praying for a child and wanting desperately to have a child, I w- would think that if I received that child, I would want them all for me. And I know many of you can relate to that because many of you have been through that struggle where you have struggled and strived for the blessing of a child. In that desire, you now look at your child with that sort of affection and attention, that sort of care, how precious they are to you because they are a blessing from God. Hannah says, if you give me this blessing, God, if you bless me with a son, he's yours. He's absolutely yours. He, he's, he's so yours that, that he'll never have a razor touch his head. That means he, he's going to be in the tradition of the Nazarite. He's going to be in this Nazarite tradition. He's going to be at the temple. He's going to be at Shiloh. He's going to be live there full time in devotion to the Lord. And I'm going to visit him on my annual visits. That's, that's not going to be a daily interaction, but I'm going to bring him signs of affection. I'm going to bring him robes once a year whenever I come. But, but on an annual basis... That will be my time with him because he will be yours. This prayer from Hannah is a prayer of formation, of deep formation. Before the child was even conceived, she was praying formation over Samuel. And I think that this is one of the charges we receive here. Moms, dads, spiritual moms, spiritual dads, listen up. We need to be praying over our children. Praying over over our children before we even have them. Praying over our children when they're conceived, before they're born. Praying over our children after they're born. We need to be praying formation over them. Praying devotion over them. Praying relationship and intimacy with Jesus over them. Praying health and healing over them. Praying that they would be that they would be able to have an impact for the kingdom of God in the years to come, decades to come. We need to be a people that pray over our children and our spiritual children. This model from Hannah isn't only a model that would then have the outcome of conception, it is a model that has an outcome of formation. It's an invitation for you and for me to be intentional in the ways in which we pray for our children. And God knows that they need it. Children today need the intercession of the people of God. They need the power and working of the Holy Spirit to go before them, to work in them, and to be their rear guard. Look, We need to be praying 
for our kids. But it's not just this one-sided witness. It's not just this invitation and, and opportunity we have as parents to pray over our kids, but it's also an, uh, an invitation for the children to live into the formation that their parents prayed for. And, and, and that happens both through the working of the Holy Spirit and it happens through the, the devotion of the children's lives. I want you to hear who Samuel is, but because if we aren't very familiar with this, uh, with this book of the Bible, then we might not realize how critical Samuel is as a leader for God. He is one of the greatest prophets in all of Scripture. And Samuel, Samuel uh, stands apart and is willing to stand for God when no one else will. Let me frame this up. We're going to look at a couple of passages that, that outline who Samuel is and how he lives into this formative uh, stage. The first is, is, uh, is framed up because Eli, remember the priest at Shiloh who had this interaction with Hannah. Eli has two sons. And these two sons are not obeying the word of the Lord. These two sons are working against God. And, and uh, Eli rebukes his children and his children persist in their sin. And there's this sharp contrast drawn. Sharp contrast drawn in 1 Samuel 2 verse 28. And this is right after we hear about Eli's disobedient, unfaithful children. And it says in verse 28, And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. You see, as others, other children, children of devoted people like Eli were straying from God. Samuel uh, was so devoted to the Lord that he lived into the formation that was laid forth by Hannah in prayer. He grew in favor and in stature and, and, and did so boldly. Now that he has favor from people, what does he do? Does he not just, does he rest in that favor? Does he say, oh, people like me. Like, I mean, that, that's, that's what some of us might be tempted to do. Well, people like me, so I'm just going to lean into that. No, Samuel doesn't sit back there. He looks out on the people of God and sees that they are building up idols, that they are, that they are straying from the way of the Lord. And so he calls forth to them in, in a call of conviction and invites them to, to live in a transformed way and to cast down their idols. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, Verse 3 and 4, here's, here's what it says about Samuel's activity. It says, So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Asheroths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. He will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals, their Asheroths, and served the Lord only. Wow. Samuel was willing to stand up boldly before the people of God to stand for the Lord and invite them to have a convicted change. Hannah's prayer of formation led to a life of devotion by Samuel. Not only was he willing to stand before the people and call for conviction and a different life outcome, but he also was willing to do that to the king. He stood before King Saul when Saul was disobedient to God and called out that Saul was no longer going to stand and rest in the Lord's blessing, but now was going to, uh, was going to be replaced. That what once was possible for his line to continue on, now it was going to be torn down because Saul was faithless. I don't know about you, but standing before the king and making that sort of testimony seems kind of bold. That's what happens in chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. Here's what Samuel says. To King Saul, you have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command. Samuel 
as a prophet of the Lord is willing to stand, stand before even his king and be a devoted witness to God. This is the legacy of Samuel that's rooted in Hannah's prayer before he is even conceived. Brothers and sisters, not only are we as parents and spiritual parents to be calling on the Lord, to be praying formation over our children and our spiritual children, also each and every one of us is a child. Each and every one of us has parents and spiritual parents. And in response to their faithfulness, we are to live devoted lives to the Lord as well. This is our charge. This is our legacy. And this is God's invitation for us today. In 2012, uh, Summer of 2012, my wife Lauren uh, came to me, and 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 in uh, her deep spiritual wisdom, uh, uh, we were having conversation. And I remember asking her. I said, "Something seems unsettled. Like it's not quite uh, like like something is not quite where you know it needs to be." And she said to me, "I believe that the Lord is calling us to adopt." I remember when she said that. It was like uh, it shouldn't have been peaceful. It shouldn't have been easy. It shouldn't have been calm. But immediately as the words were uttered out of her mouth, as, uh, as though that uh, they had been prayed over a long period of time before, I just felt an overwhelming sense of peace. And I said, of course the Lord is calling us to this. Now, it makes no sense because we were in the middle of the first year of planting covenant. I don't know if you can kind of frame that up, but we're planting a church. We're, we're, we're a part of birthing a church, and then the Lord is going to call us to expand our family. Addie and Aiden, uh, they would, uh, they're a pair, right? They're 18 months apart, and then we're going to have this, this seven-year gap and this extra blessing on our lives, right? None of this actually seems reasonable. But the Lord overwhelmed me and Lauren with this conviction and this peace. And we went through training. And we knew that the Lord was inviting us to foster, to adopt. So have, uh, have our home welcome in someone from our community that was in need. And, and, and I remember uh, this, this, this season. It was, uh, it, it was so beautiful and tumultuous. But I also acknowledged that, that there was some... Uh, some, some grieving and some pain along the way as well. We went through our trainings in August and went through all of our home visits and all of our certifications through the early fall, and we thought that we would have a child in our home by October. That didn't happen. We got to the other side of Thanksgiving, and finally we got a call. We got a call, and, and, and we were told that there was, there was this seven-month-old that needed a home and, and that she was lovely and she was uh, ready to, uh, to be seated in our home the very next day. And we were asked, will you receive her into your home? And Lauren and I discussed and called them back and said, absolutely, this is what we've been praying for. And that night we prayed together and we sought the Lord and, and we asked, Lord, uh, lo what, what do you want to call her? What do you want us to name her uh, in our family and we went to Target and we bought all seven month girl clothes and we bought like diapers and all I mean we, we did the whole thing we did the whole like like uh prepping for a child in one night thing uh and so th that was it we woke up the next morning and we got a phone call and the phone call said that uh this seven month old baby girl is no longer going to be seated in your home today and I was destroyed uh, we had prayed over her, and we had named her, and we had bought blessing for her, and I was, I was distraught. And so, um, that night we had some really good friends, actually friends that that were a part of Covenant with us, uh, and and they they took us to El Chaparro. Um, uh, I mean, it, it was it was it was a way of blessing. Um, 
And, uh, and so we actually, I, I botched that false. It was before this El Chaparro opened. My bad. It was at Rico's, which is now the El Tiempo in Panther Creek, because none of this existed in 2012. Uh, sorry. It took me a second. So we went over to Rico's, and, and our, friends, um, our, our friends sat down with us, and we, and we just we ate, and we feasted, and our families and our kids just experienced the blessing of community. And, uh, and that, at that meal, I got a phone call. And at that meal, I stepped outside the door, and I was asked, there is a three-day-old baby boy that needs a home, and we would like to place him in your home tomorrow. And I went back in, and and, I mean, I, like, whiplash, right? Like, I said, Lauren, what what do you say? Friends, Addie, Aiden, what do you say? And at that table, we decided that we would say yes. And so we left Rico's, and we went home, and we prayed, <laughs> and we prayed to the Lord, and, and uh, we, we gathered up all the seven-month girl stuff, and we went to Target, and we turned all that back in, and we bought a whole bunch of uh, baby boy stuff, and, and we, we did the blessing, and, and we, we prayed that night, Lord, what do you want us to name our son? We're not, going to, we're not going to say that because we named our daughter that we wouldn't name our son. No, we would appeal to the Lord, Lord, who are you calling our son to be? And, and 1 Samuel 1.27 the Lord spoke over us. First Samuel 127, Hannah testifies to Eli after her son is born and says this, I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. And just as Hannah prayed for Samuel, Lauren and I prayed for Samuel and we, and we blessed him with that name and when we welcomed him into our home, we held him this so dear and we prayed formation over him and we know that his life is fully devoted and committed to Jesus because that is the prayer that has been lifted up over him. Brothers and sisters, we pray over our kids as a consecration that their lives would be shaped and formed after God's own heart. And so I I implore you, Just take this witness from Hannah and let it be lived out in each and every one of us. And if this is new to you, great, try it today. Try it when you you lie in bed with your wife or your husband and pray over your children together. Let us carry this witness forward and let us watch what God does in our children's life. That will be the witness that we all get to celebrate for years to come. Would you pray with me? Lord, Lord, in this very moment, I pray for Addison and for Aiden and for Samuel. And I pray for every single child, student, infant, teenager in this church. Lord, I pray blessing over them. They are an answer to prayer. They are beloved. They are not an accident. Lord, you have formed them in their mother's womb. You have blessed them and and, and held them in safety and security. And so, Lord, we ask that you would anoint, anoint them each with the power and working of your Holy Spirit.